formal agenda items uh, and then we'll uh, hear a an update on the uh, build from the building committee uh, Pat Tompkins is he here somewhere oh there hey Pat uh, and then uh, actually phase one of the uh, following that we'll have phase one of the uh, youth risk uh, behavior study tonight will focus on the uh, the high school uh, results and then uh, at a subsequent meeting we'll we'll go over the rest of the results uh, <clears throat> at the start uh, just uh, welcome uh, dr. Darty back and uh, dr. Darty if you'd like to have anything to say or yeah I would love to thank you um, hello everyone I no way haven't been around for a couple of months but um, I just want to say a couple things before the meeting started uh, first of all I want to thank the incredible work that was done in this district in my absence uh, the work that Chris Kelly Gail Dow Dr. Jen Stice Jen Bove um, all of the building principals Joe Huggins Julian Carr um, and all of the staff that that worked on the different buildings they did they worked together as a team and they did an amazing job so we have a great team here and I think it was very evident um, throughout the last two and a half months in in my absence and I am very appreciative of everything that they did um, I also want to thank um, members of the community and the staff who kept my spirits up during my absence uh, with cards and emails and text messages and phone calls and uh, checking in to see how I was doing um, the you know it, the, the leave itself was unexpected but it was necessary and um, those those little things really helped me uh, during that in my family during that time so I just want to say thank you and I am ready to come back to work thank you John okay uh, is before we get started uh, we'll do public input is there anyone that would like to speak to something that's not on the agenda tonight seeing none uh, do we have a motion for consent agenda yes move to approve the consent agenda second second any discussion all those in favor five zero got it right tonight there you go uh, okay uh, now uh, I'm gonna leave reports until the end uh, and we'll uh, start right with the building uh, update uh, I know Joe are you gonna kick it off or Pat or Pat Tompkins thank you uh, for those of those of you who don't know me uh, my name is Pat Tompkins I'm a member of the permanent building committee um, so for the last six or eight months, the, our, the building committee has been touring all of the schools. Part of, our, um, part of the bylaws that established the committee require that we do a, um, an inventory of the physical conditions of the town buildings. Um, so, so we've been doing that. Uh, we've gone through the schools at this point. Um, we got through all the schools. Um, we took a break and created a, a report that's currently in draft form. So. Um, so I'm here to give you a little bit of an update of what we've been doing. Um, kind of broke this into three parts. Um, gonna try and be brief. I know everyone's, uh, it's gonna be a long night for everyone. But I'm gonna break this into three parts. I'll just tell you a little bit of who we are, uh, what we did, and what we found. So the, the building committee, just run through quickly, is consisted of Michael Bean. He's a, um, he's a construction manager. Um, Brad Condon is also a construction manager that has a lot of um, experience in federal buildings. Um, John Coote. John's a retired structural engineer. Um, we're very fortunate to have John on the committee. Being retired, he's done the, uh, probably done the lion's share of the legwork for us. Uh, Kirk McCormick just uh, recently joined the committee a few months ago. He's a construction attorney. Um, Greg Steppler is a, a mechanical and electrical specialist that works for Turner Construction. Um, he was also, he's a town meeting member, and he was a member of the library building committee. Um, myself, I'm a, uh, a construction manager, and many of you probably know Nancy Toomey. She's a residential architect. She was also on the library building committee, and um, it's a, a part of town meeting, town meeting member. Um, 
so what we did, um, so again, we were, we were charged with doing an um, inventory of the physical condition of the building. So we created a process where um, we started by creating a checklist for each building, um, where we look at everything in the building from the mechanical systems and the boiler, the carpet, the uh, ceilings, paint, whatever. Um, then we go through all the documents. For the most part, all the buildings have as-built documents. We go through the plans, get a gist of the building. Uh, we would go through the plans, the specifications. We'd get an equipment list from facilities, um, of all the equipment in the building that has the date when it was put into commission, um, expected lifespan uh, of the equipment. We went through the AHERA reports. Um, really tried to get through all the, all the documentation that the town has. There was an ad hoc building committee created back in 2010 that looked at all the buildings. So there's a report out there. You know, that's the type of thing we looked at. Um, then on a month-by-month -month basis, we went through all the, all the buildings, all the schools. Um, we'd walk through the buildings, um, basically we'd go through the majority of the building, hit all the hot spots. Um, for example, the high school, we came into this space, we'd come into the auditorium, do the field house. Wouldn't, couldn't go to every classroom, but we'd make sure we, we looked at classrooms um, in the representative areas of the building. Um, and then individually, we'd go through with our checklist and rate each element of the building. We'd rate them on a scale of one to five. Um, then basically, the committee would all go apart, fill out the checklists, combine them together. We'd get together and create ratings. Um, and we'd also, along the way, we'd make recommendations for anything we saw. Recommendations would vary from something as simple as some trim at Josh Eaton on the exterior that looked like it was rotting that we recommended, you know, facilities take a look at that, to some other things that were more, you know, that was pretty basic, and within a month or two that was replaced, um, to some things that are more like, you know, um, there's a crack in some CMU here, and we recommend that the facilities department takes a look at it. So. Um, so, the, so in addition to sort of rating the building, we would make recommendations. Um, when we finished, we, we created a report, which is currently in draft form, and it's under review. Um, overall, I think it was an excellent process. Um, it gave us an ability to walk through the buildings. I think as a committee, we have a very good handle on, on the buildings, you know, how old they are, and what have you. It also got um, sort of a second set of eyes for facilities. I'm sure there were, you know, Many times we were walking through something that Joe and, and Kevin maybe have walked by 10 times, but a second set of eyes is good to, to, to put on the, the, the buildings. Um, so the important part, uh, you know, what we found, oh, one, one other thing, like what we didn't do, we didn't inspect every building, every room. We didn't go on the roofs. We didn't do any testing. So, you know, we're a volunteer committee of construction professionals and design professionals that, that toured the buildings and evaluated them. It's not the same as hiring a consultant to do a full-scale investigation of these buildings. So just, you know, to keep in mind what we're doing. So what we found, um, the big picture, like there's no, there's no, no big surprises here. Uh, we didn't find much, to be honest. What we found is, is buildings that are very well maintained, um, and they're generally in good operating condition. Uh, they vary. Some of the buildings are older, and the buildings that are older, you know, they, they show it. Um, the buildings vary in age from 15 years old to 51 years old, the schools. And, uh, you know, and you can kind of tell. 51 years old, that's kill them. 15 years old is wood end. Yeah, the, they look a lot different. They all function. They're very well maintained. Um, but they're, again, showing their age. Um, one of the things we found, we think facil the facilities department is doing an excellent job. To the extent what we did was some kind of, uh, you know, test of the facilities department, I'd, I would say, and the committee would say, they, they passed with flying colors. They have a, a very well thought out plan of routine maintenance. The, um, the floors get waxed every summer. Um, the gym floors all get treated every other year. More importantly, the mechanical systems um, are all tested on a routine basis. Um, there were some suggestions that we made, uh, one of them being to do some testing of switch gear. Um, that wasn't being done, that has already been implemented, and I think it's been implemented on a couple of buildings, um, kill them being one of them. Um, so that was, so I think overall that was a, that was a good, 
a good, uh, good process. Um, one of the things to consider, there's eight school buildings. We probably have about 15 buildings in, in town. And one thing that everyone should can keep in mind, so you know, lifespan of a, of a public facility, maybe 50 to 75 years. Um, so if we have eight school buildings, that means you're replacing a building every eight to 10 years. Um, and we've probably been 10 years since there's been a major school construction project. So, you know, the, the um, best way to sum up our conclusions, I think the facilities department is doing a great job maintaining the buildings. The buildings are maintained very well. Um, they're in good condition. They range in age from 15, and Wood End's brand new, right? Wood End's 15 years old. Um, so it's not really brand new anymore. But, but they, they're out to 50, 50 years old. So there will be a time, and you're, you're probably, if we said today we want to do something, whatever that something is, you're probably three years, maybe three to five years before you put a shovel in the ground. So while the buildings are in good shape, the town should be looking at the ages of these buildings and effectively doing what you're doing right now. I think our, our process kind of reaffirmed what the school committee is doing with the enrollment study, looking at all of the buildings. Right now, we don't have an urgent need. We don't have a building that's something we've got to get out and do something to. But we will get there. We will get there in the next five to 10 years. So doing the enrollment study, so when you do that, we're going to do a project that's going to address the school system as a whole. Is um, we think that's a you know we think basically the town's on the right the right path. Um, this is a chart from our can't really see that very well, but this is a chart from our report. Again, it's a dra in draft form, but basically we rated all these components on a scale of one to five, where you can see the 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 green is a five, the blue is a four. That's good. We then took the summary. I don't know if you can see that, but each of those columns is a different section, like the electrical systems is on the far right. Um, so then we, every component of the electrical systems, we averaged all those. And you can see, generally, each system of each building winds up coming in at about a three or a four, which is fair or good. And fair, you know, fair is, you know, average wear for building age. So, um, so the, you know, the, the short end of my presentation is really no news. Um, but I guess no news is good news. Um, so if anybody has any questions. So, so Pat, will you at some point uh, sit down with the, uh, I can't think of the name of the company that's doing the enrollment study and compare notes and, and what you found in the buildings? or. Uh, that's not that's not planned right now, but absolutely, I would think that that we should do that. Um, we would make ourselves available to do it. Um, it's not tech right now on anyone's agenda, but it, you know it probably should be. I don't know exactly where the enrollment study is in the process. I was here at the last building committee meeting, and it would probably probably make sense to set that up in the next couple months. And you know, I'll talk to to Bob and Joe and and figure that out. That's a great great idea. Any other questions? Yes, Jean. A quick one. Um, first of all, a comment that I'm sure we all don't agree how lucky we are as a community to have volunteers of that caliber and that experience doing this work. So thank you for the work that you've done on a volunteer basis for our town. just want to say that. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about this grid, and I'm just glancing it over quickly so I may not be reading it right. Sure. But um, for Coolidge, plumbing systems, so it, even the yellow ones seem all kind of good. That one seems a little bit low. I know it rounds up yeah. to three, so it's close to a three, but it sort of jumps out as a little bit concerning. Killam isn't a surprise. It's the oldest building, the exterior envelope. I'm not surprised by that. Plumbing at, at Coolidge, I'm wondering if you can speak to why it didn't quite get to a three. Is it something to be concerned of? Is it easy fix? Is it, can you speak a little bit to that? Um, I can't. Uh, <laughs> I can't off the top of my head. If I had the full report in front of me, um, off the top of my head, I don't. I, I, I think it's. It, you know, it might be. It might be that the the water heaters are on the back end of their life cycle. Okay. Which so and, you know, there, there are limitations to what we did. You know, one of the limitations of what we did here is we assigned we had multiple items for each um, area, and they're equally weighted. So. 
and the quickest way to explain that is if we have a boiler, um, which could cost $50,000, and we have a little split system AC unit that could be you know, less than a $5,000 item, and one's a five and one's a three, they get weighted the same. So it's not a perfect system. I mean, it's kind of like we do the best we can. So my guess on the Coolidge is there's something, there's a couple of items. Uh, there, there wasn't anything, there really isn't much like that jumps out at us as being, I mean, Killam has, you know, Killam has a few issues like the, the drinking water. So that's, Killam probably has a low plumbing number up there. Um, but there wasn't any particular systems that really jump out at us as this is, this is really a problem. So, like I said, it rounds up to three. It's very close to three. So I don't want to be, and I know it was a general average, so I don't want to be overly nitpicky, but it sounds like whatever caused that score to be like slightly depressed, likely there is a, a reasonable explanation and a plan to address it. Correct. Right. And you know, one of the important things is like all of that scoring and our whole report is a point in time. And it's a fluctuation of a point in time. So like five years from now, a, a, a piece of equipment that has a 20 year lifespan that was in 15 years is now at 20 years. And, and, and a, the, the Coolidge plumbing could be low because of a water heater that was at the end of its lifespan that really could have already been replaced. Yep. Um, so there is some of that. And, and again, with the, um, I, I don't want to keep saying, you know, the, the facilities is doing a good job. We really feel, especially on the, the mechanical systems, it was, that was my, my impression. And um, Greg, Greg Stepler, he's, the, the mechan he's our mechanical and electrical specialist. He could probably tell you the answer to that question, by the way. <laughs> but um, but the, with the mechanical systems, the, the facilities department is really on top of their, their stuff. We'd be walking around and start talking about a boiler, and they're telling me that it was replaced in June of, you know, 10 years ago, so. So it sounds like you would expect a fair amount of, a little bit of up and down within the good range over time, and that's yeah. normal and to be expected. Yeah, yeah, Great. yeah. Thank you. Sure. So what, one other uh, comment, maybe it's more of a comment. So I'm looking at the uh, energy usage and you know, I know our, our finance committee is looking for ways to spend money, to save money. I think that's right, right? Yes. Uh, so <laughs> I'd be interested, not tonight obviously, but even you know, maybe Joe, uh, you know, where that, that state, I know we spent a lot of money on the, on the, with Noresco and where we stand in terms of square footage compared to like peers or. Uh, that, like that, like Pat said, that's a that's a point in time that you're looking at. Yep. All right. So that a lot of the uh, information that you're seeing right there can be driven by the type of winter we had when we gave him the information, the square foot cost. And he's absolutely right about Coolidge um, because it did pick up the good and the bad. And it's not bad, but the Coolidge boilers are um, new when they were in when the building was renovated. However, they're getting towards the end of their useful life, so it, it dropped the score down a little bit. Yep. And again, like you said, those are on the capital plan to replace the hot water boilers, are brand new condensing hot water boilers. And just one more thing to speak to the other thing. We're already doing um, systematic replacements of all, of all of our boilers to high efficiency condensing boilers like we're doing at the high school yet. So that, along with other energy conservation measures, is gonna help bring those numbers down. So when we're replacing this, the equipment, it's going more towards the high efficiency systems. Um, and we've done that at six of the buildings out of the 17 already. That's okay. And that will continue. Thank you. Thank you. One thing that um, Joe, Joe mentioned, and from this chart, one thing to, to pull away from it is the, the ages of the buildings. And you really got to focus generally on the, the latest renovation. Um, but that, can, that tells a little bit of, of the story. And, and I, think if, I think if as a committee we were gonna rank these buildings like in some type of sequential order, I, I would venture a guess that they, they would just mirror the age of, ages of the buildings. You could put it on a spreadsheet and sort it by either one, you'd probably wind up with the same list. Yes, Dr. Dux. Thank you. Uh, for, I just wanna reiterate what Ms. Borowski said, how fortunate we are to have such um, expertise willing, people with this expertise willing to help us out this way. Thank you and your team so much. Um, I just wanted to 
say what I was hearing in terms of these ratings and what you've found. So what I'm hearing is that we have a good heads up that in, it takes two to three, uh, three to five years to get some construction going. So we have a heads up about what we need to start thinking about and we're doing that. Yeah. But there's nothing that you found that was dangerous for our children or that, that you would like highlight, you gotta do this now because our facilities department is on it. Thank you very much, facilities department. Um, so aside from substituting the, bub the water yeah. coolers for the water, there's not anything that you found that puts any children or staff in jeopardy in these buildings? No, it's no, we, there, was, there, were, there were no, you know, Real, I don't know what you'll call it, an aha moment or like a or an oh, you know what moment um, it, when we went through the buildings. Um, I will also, you know, getting back to like the the routine, the fire department they go through schools twice a year or once a year. Uh, once a year in the summer they go through the buildings yeah. and they do periodic surprise visits. Yeah. So the fire department is going through each building in the summer, you know, making sure most important from a fire safety standpoint, the absolute number one thing is the fire alarm and they're they're making sure that's working and egress paths. Um, so, I mean, we're not safety, again, I, I, there, was, there, was, there was nothing that really jumped out at us as like an urgent thing. We did come up with recommendations and you know, they, they varied from some things that, that Joe is calling on a consultant to come in and look at. Uh, nothing that we you know, lose sleep over, be, be concerned about. You know, they vary from, from looking at some cracks in a slab that we're gonna have a consultant look at to, uh, to, you know, there's some trim rotting and over the summer all that got replaced. And, you know, they're probably more than halfway through the recommendations. It's a rolling process. We've been doing this for six months and giving them the recommendations. But I'm just gonna say more than halfway through those recommendations, the facilities department has been. And some of it's like, you know, we'd come up with a recommendation on something and it's like already on the capital plan. You know, you know a water heat is 30 years old and it, should, should probably be looked into and it's already on the capital plan for the next three years. There's a lot of that type of stuff. Can I just say um, thank you very much. So when I was asking about danger, I guess the question also is that would interfere with learning in the school because that's also the other consideration. It's not just danger. And so I'm hearing you say that's Yeah, at the same not time, I'm not an educator. Like yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a builder. I could, I could tell you how much it costs and how fast we can build this this room, but I can't tell you if this is a great place to teach kids. It's not. That's so fair. you know that would, you. that would kind of fall into limitations, and that's how we looked at it. We're looking at at buildings. Okay. I mean, we know their schools, and we got that in mind. But you know, is is pick your school up there? Is it a good place to teach kids? Are the is the square footage of the classroom size like appropriate for the the appropriate enrollment? Is it, 18, 20, 25 kids, that's not my expertise. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Sure. Yes, Dr. Corm. Jeffrey Corm, Ridge Road. I thank you again also for the report and for the work. I'm just a little troubled. There must be something wrong with your spreadsheet because of all the yellows down at the bottom. If you look up at the sprinkler system, they're all fours except the average is 3.4. It doesn't work. Um, maybe the NA messes you up, but then in the Probably electrical the system, the electrical systems, the two threes are 3.47 and 3.4 something, and the average is 3.40. So there's something wrong with the. It says preliminary draft. So I would I would venture a guess that the the totals column Fair there's field. there's something going on there. Maths yeah, is hard, thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you very much. Pat. One one thing, just um, a quick the, the the team we had that that worked on this, the members of the building committee all did an excellent job, and I just while I'm here, quick shout out to them. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Erica. Back 
sure. Should I begin? Yes, yes. You go? Thank okay. You. So good evening, everyone. I'm Erica McNamara. I'm the director of the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse for the Town of Reading. We are located over at the Reading Police Department and spend a lot of our time here at the Reading Public Schools. I've been the YRBS coordinator since 2009, um, so it's typically tradition for me to come and share the key findings with all of you. Um, tonight, we'll focus on the high school. Um, this is the first time presenting this data to you, so we may find some teeny tiny errors as we go through, and I'll point those out if I notice anything that we should pay attention to, and we will send you an updated draft if there's anything um, that's glaring, so just want to point that out. So we will get started. So a little bit about the cycle for YRBS. It happens every two years on the odd years. Um, this was the first time that we partnered with um, the other parts of the Middlesex League with 11 districts and coordinated with um, Leahy Health and John Snow Inc to actually do a collaborative survey. So we agreed on a core survey, and we also did data collection within the same time frame, and then all of the results were analyzed by the same consultant. Previously, we, as a district, hired our own consultant, and um, the only difference with this process was the collaboration with the superintendents, which I think was very helpful, and John was part of that process. Um, we start the survey pretty much after we finished the previous survey, so we've been working on the 2019 survey since end of 2017 so <laughs> it's a it's a two-year process to look at the questionnaire to start building towards if we're going to need to make any changes to start planning for data collection um, to learn from the previous survey so there's a lot of pre-work that goes into all of this there was superintendent meetings that happened for over six months before it got to the stage of actually looking at, at questionnaires so thank you to John for all of his hard work thank you to Chris and Gail for their support over the summer as I was preparing the presentation and a special thank Thank you to Lieutenant Abadi and Officer Lewis um, and Tom Zaya for their support um, as we've been pulling this together and to Kate for helping coordinate all of the data collection um, which we'll talk about as we go through. Principal Boyd and I mean, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so why do we collect this data? Really the focus is to look at prevalence data. How do we, how do we look at a broad spectrum of issues amongst our young people. So this focuses really on those most pertinent risk behaviors, but also some of the protective factors that we want to continue to build amongst our young people that can scaffold them and protect against risk. So really when we think about some of these protective factors, it's a constant balancing act that's very dynamic. We may have young people who are struggling in one area of their life and thriving in another, and that's very normal and part of growing and changing. Um, so we're constantly trying to focus on how do we build those internal assets with young people, as well as provide the external asset support within the school community as well as in the broader community to reduce um, the opportunity for risk. When we think about some of the key areas where youth experience risk, some of it is internal. Um, when we think about brain development, mental health, some of it is external, um, relates to relationships or lack of relationships with others. Um, so one of the key focuses of our district has always been about connectedness, focusing on building trusted relationships. And a key piece of the protective factors and the scaffolding and the, the system of support that we're constantly trying to build as a healthy school community is that connectedness piece. So in terms of the survey overview, it's based on the Centers for Disease Control instrument, which has been, uh, been in, in action since 1990 as a survey. The risk behaviors range from um, alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, my favorite subject, um, unintentional injuries, which relate to um, driving and other risks, mental health, unhealthy dietary behaviors, sexual behavior, bullying, and violence. And then the protective factors focus on those trusted relationships I mentioned, um, how much sleep young people are getting or not getting, screen time, physical activity, and also how young people perceive both parent attitudes and peer attitudes. So is the data reliable? This is a question I get a lot. 
Um, and basically the way that the questionnaire was developed is it is a evidence-based instrument. So the way the questions are worded are very specific and very thoughtful and they have been tested and retested. So we don't just throw in a question. <laughs> it has to be vetted. Um, through the CDC, and if we add a local question, sometimes we, we may consider that as a pilot question. So we have done some things like that over the years. We were one of the first districts to start asking about particular aspects of substance abuse. We were one of the first districts to ask about stress, and we did pilot some questions. But for the most part, 99% of the survey is part of the CDC core survey, and there's been hundreds of studies that have been done on the wording and testing of each of the questions. In terms of do students tell the truth? So young people have the option to take the survey or to not take the survey. Um, the CDC research indicates that the data is as reliable as collecting adult data of, this, of a similar nature. So if you were asked as an adult to fill out a survey. We do have internal reliability checks that are built into the survey. And we also have a data cleaning process that happens um, by experienced consultants. So a little bit about the survey itself. Um, parents were given an opportunity to review the survey and opt out their student if they so chose. Um, survey proctors, which are members of the, the high school team, um, signed confidentiality forms. And computers were provided for students to access the survey. Um, basically, Principal Boynton set it up so each grade had a day during a flex block where they took the survey. And they were done in small groups. Um, the wellness staff, teachers, and administrators were the proctors for the survey. Um, we each read a script, so it was standardized. We all said the same thing um, and managed the room in a similar way. Um, all sur surveys and answers were anonymous. No identifying information was recorded on the surveys. The questionnaire is uh, 111 questions for the high school. Um, it was short enough to be completed in one class block. This was the first time that young people took the survey online. Previously, it was pen and paper with Scantron sheets. So this was a little bit different. Young people did finish the survey faster this year um, because of the online uh, nature of taking it. Participation was voluntary. Sometimes young people start the survey and decide to stop it, and that's totally fine and part of the protocol to allow young people to just take out work and work on something that they prefer to if they wish. Um, if they want see a question that makes them uncomfortable, they may skip it. Um, so it's a very you know, supportive process if there's no um, calling a young person out if they choose to stop or discontinue. Um, so in terms of the Middlesex LEAP collaboration with JSI and Leahy, previously the survey has been paid for by the district and the cost has ranged between seven and $11,000 to hire the consultant. This year, Leahy donated $50,000 to pay for the survey for the 11 districts. Um, so this is a, quite a gift in the sense of um, saving our community some money. Um, but we don't know if that, that support will continue. So it is something we will continue to have to budget for. Um, so there were 11 school districts. All of the Middlesex League, with the exception of Lexington, chose to participate. So in terms of data cleaning, this is one of those reliability checks. Um, they used a, a specific secure computer server. Um, the data um, collection was opened in the morning and closed at the end of every day. They checked surveys on a daily basis as we were doing data collection over a week-long period. The overall rate of completion were checked for each survey. And records with fewer than 30 valid responses and fewer than 25 responses from middle schools were removed. There were logical edits on each of the questionnaires. There's some questions that are asked three different ways, and some of those reliability checks, when they don't match those, those excuse me, um, questionnaires get thrown out. So about 77 surveys were removed through data cleaning. So the following slides highlight elements of the survey with 111 questions. That's quite a bit of data. <laughs> and so tonight I'm just going to give you the kind of the brief highlights. So in terms of the survey respondents, it was pretty um, even in terms of and representative of the school um, grade by grade in terms of who participated in the survey. Um, from a race and ethnicity perspective, this is representative of our high school population. So 1,015 young people um, responded to the survey. So let's start with um, one of the questions that relates to unintentional injury, the use of seatbelts. Um, it's something that we kind of take for granted in our society, and we're very glad to see that the majority, uh, overwhelming majority of our young people are wearing seatbelts. But we still have 4% that are rarely or never wore a seatbelt, so it's always a good reminder to encourage young people to wear those seatbelts. They do save lives. In terms of distracted driving, this question was added to the YRBS a few years ago with you know, the change in cell phone use and texting. And 
it's amazing how quickly this number has doubled. Um, so in 2017, it was 21% of young people that said during the past 30 days they texted or emailed while driving a car. Now it's up to 41%. I will say if you look at adult surveys asking similar questions, adults are texting or emailing while driving at rates of 70%. So we are not setting a great example with this one. So we have a lot of work to do as a society on this one. Um, but keeping in mind, we continue to educate especially our newer drivers about not using devices while they're driving. Um, this question relates to getting in a car with someone that drank alcohol. Obviously, that's a risky behavior because we are concerned about opportunities for accidents and, um, impairing, and being impaired while driving. So the, the reading rate actually decreased from 2017 by 3%, but our rate continues to be um, a little bit higher than the rest of the Middlesex League. So it's an area we're continuing to work on and educate young people about. What I will say about this is it doesn't mean that they necessarily drove with a driver their age that drank alcohol. It could be anyone. So it could have been an adult that they got in a car with um, that drove, drank alcohol and drove. So just keeping that in mind. It, we are still at the state rate and, and lower than the national rate. In terms of distracted uh, driving after drinking alcohol, 7% um, of young people that answered the question said that they drove after drinking. So when you think about 1,000 kids responding to the survey, that's about 70 kids um, on, on our roads that are taking a really serious risk. And that rate is slightly higher than the league, a little bit higher than the state and the national average. If we look at substance misuse on school grounds, these are um, one question has been asked for many years, and one question is newer to the survey. Um, so the first part is during the past 30 days on how many days did you have at least one drink of alcohol on school grounds. Um, the rate was 8% in 2011. It's now down to 3% in 2019, which is really enormous progress. Um, I will point out that young people are reporting this. Adults may or may not have seen them have a drink on school grounds. So it's important to point that out that this could be concealed behavior. Um, a new question to the survey was asking, did you use marijuana on school grounds? And 8% of young people reported that they did, and that's about 1% higher than the Middlesex League rate. Erica, can that include CBD oils and all of that? Is that taken into effect or um, is that That's separate? how young people interpret that question. Okay. We didn't have a specific CBD uh, oil question. <clears throat> we had a synthetic marijuana question, which I'll talk a little bit about, but not CBD specifically. Um, in terms of young people who um, drove after drinking alcohol compared to their league peers, um, uh, you know, we're on par with, with some of our, our peers, but um, definitely still higher than, uh, than a lot of the league. So it's something, again, to keep an eye on. Question on that one real quick? I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, Go ahead. Just since we've started the interrupting thing. Um, is this at all potentially related to number of students who have cars and the ability to drive? Yes, it absolutely is. So we have more drivers um, in the more affluent communities, more drivers, Winchester um, has more drivers, but we haven't done um, the survey in terms of per capita number of cars. Um, but anecdotally, that's uh, something that has come up. Yeah. That's good, but just, that's not Yes, a, no, I appreciate the context. Like yeah, there, yeah the absolutely. Yeah. Um, we ask um, these two questions on negative stress were actually pilot questions back in 2011. And it was exciting to see that these questions were actually included on the core survey for the entire Middlesex League. So now this has become a comparison question for the entire league. Um, and the reason why we thought it was important is we often ask young people a lot about stress management and what's going on, but we wanted to get into a little bit more about what are the specific areas that are, that are causing pressure on them or, or making them feel uncomfortable or making things feel a little bit challenging. So when we look at this, we see that um, school demands is obviously a big chunk of that. But I do think it's important to point out that only 4% is social pressure. And social pressure is often the area that, as adults, we tend to think of as 90% of the problem. Um, so I just think it's important to see it's a variety, just as it is for adults. You know, if you were to think about your own life, and you probably would have a similar split of all the different things that are going on. And for young people, it's very similar. Um, we also asked specifically in terms of school stress, what do you, um, which of the following do you find the most stressful about school? And keeping up with schoolwork was the most significant. Um, having to study things you don't understand, whether that's a new, new subject for them or a harder class, things like that. Um, not as much going to school, which a lot of folks expect that one to be high. Um, so just something to keep in mind. 
Um, for this one, on your slide, um, the text underneath the headline is incorrect, so I just want to point out the wording of this question is actually, did you purposely hurt yourself without wanting to die, such as cutting or burning yourself? The rate in 2007 was 17%. It's now down to 12%. That's enormous progress. This is a very difficult behavior for young people who struggle with non-suicidal uh, self-injury. It is a habitual coping behavior, and it can take um, a lot of work to discontinue that behavior. So to see that number come down to 12% is, um, is very exciting to see young people um, using more coping strategies that are healthier. In terms of depression, um, this is a depression indicator, not that young people have depression. So the depression indicator is, have you ever felt so sad or hopeless almost every day for two plus weeks in a row that you stopped doing some usual activities? And the rate right now is 24%. It is pretty comparable to what else is going on in our country, but obviously that's still an area that we wanna look at and, and keep doing a lot of work on. Suicidal ideation is a set of questions. So we, when we think about suicidal ideation, we think about young people's thought process in terms of are they seriously thinking about it? Have they made a plan about would they attempt suicide and have they actually made an attempt? The two first pieces are actually very critical to understanding um, what a young person is struggling with. So if you look at the Reading numbers, 10% um, seriously considered attempting, 8% made an actual plan, and 3% attempted suicide. Those rates are slightly lower than, than the uh, comparable rates. But, and 1% is too high, mm. right? So it's an area we'll, we'll continue to work on. It's very important that we uh, focus on suicide prevention. Um, the, we have made progress since 2005. Um, so if you look at um, attempts in 2005, it was at 7%. So coming down to 3% is obviously progress. But again, any more than zero is, is too much. Um, we ask young people, are you um, currently taking medicine or receiving treatment from a doctor or other mental health professional? Um, and right now, in 2019, 19% uh, said that they were currently engaged with a treatment professional. Electronic bullying, this is a question that we started asking in 2011 um, when computers and uh, smartphones became more um, part of our daily life. And as you can see, the rate has gone down um, from 23% down to 12%. So that's impressive. Young people are getting savvier about how they manage themselves online. Adults are savvier about what young people are using and being a little bit more protective about how they manage technology. Um, but it's still an area that we gotta keep an eye on because any type of electronic bullying can be very difficult for young people because it never stops in the sense that if, it's, if you have access to your technology, you have, you're, you're constantly getting that attention that is very, very negative and upsetting. This year we asked a specific question, um, how many times has someone posted something online about you, whether it's on social media or somewhere else online that made you upset or uncomfortable? This isn't bullying per se, but obviously upsetting and could lead to future bullying. And um, a significant number of young people had experienced that, so it's an area to keep an eye on. Because um, I'm just going to go back to this one thing. When we talk to young people about you know, how their day goes, we often think about their in-person interactions, and we sometimes leave out what could have happened online. <laughs> so I just encourage people to think a little bit more broadly about when you talk to young people about what's happening. Um, keep in mind that they also have a virtual life um, that, is, that is going on at the same time. In terms of bullying on school property, um, the rate has significantly dropped since 2011. Um, there's been a lot of bullying prevention programs that have been put in place, um, bullying prevention policies, um, went from 27% down to 12%. So that's a significant gain. But again, when it comes to this type of behavior, more than zero is, is still too much. Physical fighting, this is a question that just looks at um, young people who reported getting into a physical fight in the year before the survey. This didn't necessarily happen on the school grounds, it could have happened anywhere. Um, young people at the high school level reported 16%, which is lower than the state and the national rate, but still slightly higher than the league. In terms of weapon carrying, young people are asked questions around, did you carry a weapon on school property, um, such as a gun, knife, or club, on at least one day during the month prior to the survey? Um, for high school age young people in Reading, 2% reported that they carried a weapon. I do want to point out that 
that not, isn't something necessarily that we would be aware of. Um, so this is, their, this is them saying that they carried a weapon, not necessarily that we have reports they carried a weapon. Um, then 5% felt threatened or injured with a weapon on school property. So that could be someone saying they have a weapon, not necessarily having it, but using it as a threat to intimidate a young person. So as you can see, the rates are very similar across the Middlesex League with threatened uh, with a weapon. So again, just keeping in mind some of these behaviors um, are pretty similar across um, the comparison uh, groups. In terms of violence, um, this is a set of questions that are new to the survey. Um, looking at sexual violence, um, we have asked questions that are similar, but the wording is slightly different this year. So 9% of Reading High School young people said that they experienced sexual violence in the past year. Um, and when we asked um, did they experience um, it by someone they were dating, the rate was 5%. So the 9% refers to anyone, and the 5% refers to if they had a dating relationship with the person. And if you look at how that compares, um, comparable to the state rate, slightly higher than the league, and lower than the national rate. In terms of safety, I think this is a really important question um, for young people who may struggle with their own perception of safety or feeling intimidated or worried about coming to school, either because something happens on the way to school or they are worried about how they'll, um, how they'll be on campus. So 6% reported that they didn't come to school because they felt unsafe, um, and that's about average um, to the other comparison, slightly lower than the national rate. When we think about substance use, which is the next section, I want to just kind of point out part of what we've been trying to do over the last 11 years through the work of our CASA as a community coalition, working with our schools, our police, and our town, as well as the broader community, is really to decrease the risk factors, increase those protective factors so that we can create a safer community. If we can turn down the heat a little bit around substance abuse, we can make enormous gains. So when we think about vaping use, this is an area that has been a big struggle. Uh, we've been working on vaping prevention for seven years. As you've seen in the national news, people are catching up, which is wonderful. We love the national attention. We hate that young people are suffering because we've known for many, many years how dangerous these products are, but we didn't have the science to back it up. So currently, we have a 4% increase in the number of young people who've tried vaping. And that's a quick increase from just two years. So that's an area, obviously, that we're working very heavily on in terms of vaping prevention. But we have seen a slight decrease in the number of young people who use vapes in the last month. So a little bit of a gain. When we think about cigarette use, we often think that it's completely gone. We've seen a huge decrease in the number of young people using cigarettes. In 2005, 18% of young people at the high school level reported smoking cigarettes. It's down to 6%, but as you could just see by the vaping numbers, it's just that behavior has just been replaced by vaping. What I will say, it's been interesting to look at vaping behavior. Many vapors actually transition back into regular cigarette use. So we have young people who are um, vapors that end up becoming regular cigarette smokers as well. So there's kind of a crossover with those behaviors. But we have seen a 12% decrease, which is, which is healthy. We asked young people for the first time about their quitting behaviors. Did they try to quit? Um, so 74% said they don't use tobacco products, but of the young people who do use them, 14% said they were trying to quit, um, and 12% hadn't considered it yet. What's helpful about knowing they're trying to quit, that contemplative phase is very helpful in terms of changing behavior, so we have an opportunity to intervene and, and make some changes with young people. When we think about underage drinking, it's actually the aspect of um, substance abuse that causes the most injury for young people. We hear a lot about the opioid crisis, which is a very significant concern for our community. But when we talk about young people, particularly high school level, alcohol is our number one enemy when it comes to the level of risk that it causes. Whether it's assault, falls, um, impairment to the brain, alcohol poisoning, um, and also the increased level of addiction. So young people who start using alcohol before the age of 15, the data now shows they're six times more likely to become dependent on the substance. That rate used to be three times more likely, but with the advances in brain science, we now know that the dependency rate is actually much higher the earlier they start using. When we look at current underage drinking, that's why this number means so much. Um, 45% in 2005, now down to 33%. So when we think about the number of injuries that that could have prevented, that's pretty significant. So a 12% decrease. And that didn't just happen. We did a lot of collaborative work to make that happen, and I'll, I'll speak to that in a few minutes. 
When we think about the 12% decline, it's very exciting. It's a 33%. I think in your slide it might be listed as 35%, so I apologize for the typo. Uh, but the rate is 33% of young people said that they drank in the past 30 days. That rate is higher than the Middlesex League, um, a little bit higher than the state, and a little bit higher than the national rate. Um, but it is something to keep in mind that although we're making progress with the 12% decline, we still have a lot of work to do. When we think about binge drinking, which is an even riskier behavior because of its risk for alcohol poisoning, um, the rate has dropped by 10%, which is very significant, um, but we still have work to do. Um, a 10% decline is, is significant, but it's still higher than the league rate, the national rate, and the state rate. We asked a new question around binge drinking. Usually we ask the question, did you have four drinks in a few hours if you're a female, five drinks in a few hours if you're a male? We asked a new question about 10 or more drinks in a few hours, which is very high risk binge drinking, and 4% of young people, as well as the league and the, the nation, responded to that. So that's 40 young people that could be at risk for alcohol poisoning. So that's concerning and an area that we'll continue to work on. Um, this is a new question, asking young people um, how they access alcohol to some extent. 7% said that they attended parties held in homes in Reading where alcohol was frequently allowed. So that's something to kind of keep in mind is that as parents we need to communicate with each other on what our concerns might be and how we manage our home and whether or not alcohol is or isn't allowed um, in terms of safety. And then there's 8% that um, said that they're not sure, and yes, 21% said occasionally it's available. So it's just an area to keep in mind that we may think our young people know what is allowed in our homes, but we actually have to be as concrete and clear about that as possible. In terms of consequences, this is also a new question. We, we thought it was important to ask young people what it meant for them if they drank and something bad happened. So this looks at what were some of the areas where things went wrong. And as you can see, they're, they're pretty significant areas. Got in a car with someone who was uh, driving drunk or high, got in a physical fight, got hurt or injured, damaged property, got sick, forgot where you were. 17% forgot where you were. That's scary. Uh, did something you regretted, which could mean a lot of things. Um, had sex when you didn't want to. Um, consent becomes very blurred when young people are drinking. And 12% got in trouble. So just something to keep in mind, it's not, you know, we often minimize alcohol because it's so socially acceptable, but there's a lot of things that young people have to contend with um, if they do engage in drinking behavior. In terms of underage marijuana use, um, the rate is down 3%. Um, obviously, you know the state laws have changed and the environment around marijuana has shifted, so that rate is not as low as we would like it to be. Um, we can see that the rates are pretty similar, the league rate, the national rate, and the state rate. We do ask a separate question on synthetic marijuana use. Synthetic okay. marijuana is something that is accessed through social sources and often online. It's often marijuana that's been sprayed with chemicals um, and actually can create a lot of injury. Um, and we have had cases where young people have gotten quite ill. Um, so 7% of young people have said they've used synthetic marijuana, which is often referred to as K2 or spice. Or fake, or fake weed, and that's a typo there, so I apologize. But it does, these are some of the adverse effects that have been found amongst medical professionals, um, blood pressure issues, um, kidney injury, hallucinations is what we hear the most, um, and um, agitation. Um, we also talk to young people about, in terms of non-prescribed um, prescription drug use, are they misusing a, a prescription drug to get high? In 2011, the rate was 8%, it's now 5%, so that has been a slight decrease. If we look at different types of substances, um, these are some of the areas um, that we always ask about. Inhalants, um, which is at 6% currently, cocaine, 5%, um, heroin, 5%, meth, 5%, non-prescribed steroids, meaning they're misusing steroids, um, and because there also could be medical steroids that are allowed for lots of medical conditions, but these are the, the ones that are not good for you. And then 3% illegal drug in injection. So you can see with heroin and meth, they've gone up by 1%, um, and that's an area that we'll, we do do education on all of these substances in our health education programs. Um, we also added the question <coughs> on the use of ecstasy, and the current rate is 5% um, for ecstasy use, which is 2% higher than the league rate and state rate, and a little bit higher than the national rate. 
Um, now we're going to switch to sexual behavior. Before I move on, is there any questions so far? I know that it's a lot of data and numbers coming at you. <coughs> Doing okay? Um, one of the things you said struck me about, uh, it was on page 14, about students going back to cigarettes. Yes. From vaping. And I'm constantly left speechless by the ads on TV that show vaping as a way to break the cigarette habit, which leaves the impression that it's a healthy option. Right. Um, is there some help coming on those ads? Are they going to stop those deceptive ads? Mm -hmm. And is that something you address during your visits to our schools? And I'm just it's a great thing to point out. Um, the state campaign is currently getoutrage.org for a reason. It's outrageous what is being shared with young people, what is being targeted to young people. Basically, um, the vaping companies have taken the playbook from the old um, tobacco companies and just basically rewrote it. Um, it's the same exact uh, techniques and tactics to engage young people. And the marketing piece is not co covered under the tobacco settlement laws from the smoking era. Um, lawsuits that happen, which is why the marketing is allowed. There's loopholes right now. The FDA supposedly um, is, is going to be making some changes. Um, we have been advocating for the marketing to be restricted for many, many years. Um, there's so much product placement with vaping. Um, there's so many celebrity endorsers. It's a huge area of concern. But when young people learn a little bit more about why they're being targeted, um, they do get interested in talking about, you know, why are we the guinea pigs for this product? Um, the Juul product really is engineered for young people, there is no question. It's easy to use. It's an amazing delivery device to get an enormous amount of nicotine into your body in a very short period of time. One tiny pod has a pack of cigarettes worth of nicotine in it. Most young people are going to go through a pod very quickly. Whereas if you have a pack of cigarettes, it's going to take you a while to smoke a pack. Um, so the level of dependency with vaping products is much higher. And the reason why sometimes young people switch to smoking is um, the effects of vaping on their body. So they start to feel some of those effects and think smoking might be healthier, <laughs> uh, which is very backwards, but, it, you know. And the idea of it being a cessation product, <coughs> there are adults that have said that it could be helpful for them, um, but the idea of the vaping as a cessation product was that people would be tapering down the levels of nicotine they were using. What Juul has done is increase the amount of nicotine fourfold that is in one pod. So it is no, no longer even remotely a type of cessation device. It's way more nicotine than people were getting through smoking cigarettes. So I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> it does. Erica, do you see ways of, of reducing high school risk on school property? Yes, I mean, we're increasing education. Our administrators are enormously vigilant. Um, the amount of um, vapes that they have um, procured, our school resource officer, um, we have a number of young people who've gone through our education program and referred to services. Um, we have a very specific policy for young people who are caught a second time with vaping. They do have to visit their primary care provider and get assessed. So there's a lot of things that are in place, um, but we're, we need to continue to do more. So we are working with our region, with our state, and with the national groups to figure out what else can we do, where, where are the other best practices. So we're always learning, um, but it, it is challenging. You, and I know you and I talked earlier, the, the vaping alarms that are, are being installed in schools, do you see that as a deterrent at all? I, I'm not sold on it yet. Um, the jury's still out. Our, our school resource, um, Brian Lewis, has been tracking this because some um, communities have installed them. Um, they do, they're not perfect in terms of catching, because the way that the vapes are now engineered, they're no longer, there's no odor now. So whether or not they actually, the alarms are actually working the way they're supposed to is, and there's a delay. So by the time administrators or our staff can respond, um, you still would need to look at cameras outside of the bathroom. And the bathroom's a tricky thing. It is important to have as safe a bathroom as we can, but it's also an area where young people need privacy because it's the bathroom. <laughs> so it's a very delicate balance um, that our staff faces with protecting the bathroom and giving young people who might be in the bathroom because they don't feel well or they have anxiety or there's other issues going on. So, you know, I wouldn't... Uh, say what is right for the administrators to do, but what I will say is that our school resource officer and I are constantly looking at what else is going on and what can we do better, but the alarms themselves are not really changing anything. And as far as we know at the Vogue so far, it's not really been 
all that helpful. Anything else you want to add, Bry? Uh, it's just it's difficult for the administrators to be alone with those It could be six kids inside the bathroom, and now that's six students that the administrators have to interview and possibly search, and there's you know, rights there that the students yep. have that the school can't improve them. So it's very challenging. Autumn, did you have a question? I just wanted to like say um, that I often try to encourage my friends, and I do this too, that if I do think that someone is in the bathroom baking, or they're in there like with their friends, just sitting on the floor, like doing nothing, it's usually a good idea to report them. And so, like just to say, hey, there's someone in this bathroom, I think they're probably doing something they shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. It's more forward with like being confident enough to say, mm -hmm. hey, like I don't know how I feel about this. And I think that there are a fair number of kids that are actually being listened to that. Yep. Um, so I think that that is a positive thing that there are kids willing to be like, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, um, and kind of be that little nudge, I guess. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wakefield's um, peer leadership group has done a fabulous job at um, kind of increasing, taking back the bathroom, so to speak. And so there's a lot of great examples of youth um, kind of being a huge piece of changing the culture around this. And that is something we're working towards this year. Autumn has been part of our vaping prevention work in the past. And um, with Lauren Gablinski, who's one of the guidance counselors and our new staff person with our CASA, we will be doing more peer leadership and peer prevention work um, to continue to raise the profile and encourage young people to um, care about their space and speak up about their space, because it is a shared space. So there's no easy answers, I will say. I think there's a lot of hope around the alarms, but it didn't exactly pan out to be the answer. Thank you. Um, so, so two things, actually, if I remember the second after I start the first. Autumn, thank you so much for being involved again um, and for that suggestion. Where my mind was going was around that connection piece that you talked about before, how important it is for our students to feel connected with adults. And I know that in the past, one of the techniques, or maybe I think it's in the recesses of my memory, that one of the ways that smoking was addressed was by um, stationing staff mm -hmm. around the bathroom. So it's not cameras people are going through, not in the bathrooms, yep. but around so that there's eye contact, mm -hmm. there's a connection as people go in, people, staff know if someone's come out. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking a lot of, about a lot of the things that you're reporting here, whether it's self, if it's cutting or if it's other people stress, mm -hmm. kids needing to connect. Um, and wondering whether there is adequate staffing, whether you're talking about that, whether teachers feel that might help with, you know, just, I, it's, I mean, the I use of monitors is something that's talked about in different schools, implemented in different ways. I will say that um, in the last couple of years, monitors, the perception around monitors amongst young people has changed. They see that sometimes as, as targeting them. Um, and so there are some issues around that, um, but it is not an area that we haven't talked about or wouldn't talk about, but it is something to keep in mind is, again, young people are going to the bathroom because they have a need to go to the bathroom. Some young people are misusing the bathroom, but we also have 90% of the kids going to the bathroom for the reasons you go to the bathroom. So we have, right, we have to balance those needs, um, and you have an amazing team that's thinking about all of the different pieces, but not at the expense of safety. Um, our district is known as one of the toughest when it comes to confiscating and dealing with substance use issues, including vaping. All of the surrounding communities, seven of them, currently use our program. So we were one of the first to start doing this work, um, and we're constantly learning as the other groups are implementing how we can learn from them. Um, but your administration has been on the forefront from the beginning. Thank you so much. So we're going to transition into sexual behavior, unless oh, other questions? I, I did have oh, one Oh, sorry, more. I apologize. So you said you had two, and I rushed you. I apologize. No, that's OK. I actually remembered my second question. So back on um, page 10, yep. you talk about the um, misuse of medication. Yes. Um, and I know that RACASA has been really instrumental in putting the container in the police 
um, lobby yep. so that people can get rid of medications mm -hmm. when they're prescribed a pain pill and they're not going to use it yep. and to move it out of your glove, out of, not your glove compartments, well maybe, yep. but out of Sorry. your um, <laughs> medicine cabinets mm -hmm. into that place. Um, when you ask the kids this question, is it clear to them what kinds of medicines you're talking about? So and previously we asked specific questions um, on pain, re um, misuse of pain relievers, uh, misuse of tranquilizers, so there was a, a category of different areas that we would ask. On the most current survey, they collapsed that because prescription drug misuse is now more widely known and young people pretty much know what you're talking about. Um, but young people can misuse any substance, any drug. Um, so what the question we're really trying to get at is, are you misusing anything that should be prescribed for a specific reason? So that could be something like Adderall. It could be something that um, is, is, is more like codeine, you know, so it can be different things. And they all matter because any misuse, um, you know, Adderall is still a stimulant, it can be misused. So there's a lot of different components to that. Can I ask one more? And uh, Sorry. The, the other thing that I'm wondering in terms of that is I know that these energy drinks are not considered necessarily drugs, yeah. but we have kids whose hearts are stopping because they're using these regularly and too much. Mm -hmm. So is that anywhere in this? It's, it's definitely, it, we've done projects on that previously. It's something that Mr. Zay and I worked on with students and one of, and one of our previous school nurses. Um, it's definitely something that particularly our health staff are very aware of in terms of assessing young people. If someone comes in with a very fast heart rate, um, sometimes it's the stimulant of the caffeine, too much caffeine, and also too much nicotine. So those are things that our staff are a little bit more aware of because of the use of these drinks. And young people are using caffeine at unprecedented levels. If you looked at caffeine use of young people 20 years ago, it was very different because coffee shops weren't as prevalent. So young people are using more caffeine, but when you think about energy drinks, it's a triple dose sometimes along with sometimes the misuse of nicotine. And then if you throw in misuse of Adderall on top of it, you've got a very stimulated, unhealthy situation on your hands. So in terms of ER visits, there are some of our ER professionals have said they've seen young people come in with um, issues with their heart um, because of overuse of energy drinks, nicotine, and misuse of Adderall or Ritalin. Thanks. All right. Yeah. OK, to move forward. Um, so we ask young people, have you ever had sexual intercourse? An uncomfortable question for adults to think about, but important to understand for our young people in terms of their own protection. Um, in 2005, the rate was 28%. It's currently 26%. Of the 26%, we also asked if they used a condom um, in terms of protection. Only 38% of the 26% said that they used a condom for protection. We also ask at what age did they first have sexual intercourse. The reason we ask that is because it can also reveal <coughs> history of trauma, history of potential sexual molestation or sexual assault. So one of the things that you can see is 3% um, were 11 years old or younger. So obviously something to have us understand as a society that we still have a lot of work to do in this area. It's a, an extremely underreported, under dealt with subject in our, in our society that we have to continually look at. We are lucky in that we have an amazing detectives division that are all highly trained. Um, we have a great partnership with the Middlesex District Attorney's Office and with the Department of Children and Family Services. If there is a case, we have a system. There's a number of, of people who are involved that can assist. But many people do not report this happening until they are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and sometimes never. So. We also ask if they most recently have had sexual intercourse, uh, 21%. Um, we also asked if they used a pregnancy prevention method. Um, in 2019, only 12% that reported being sexually active did not use any method, um, and 3% actually reported getting pregnant um, or getting someone else pregnant, and that rate is slightly higher at 1%. We also asked young people if they've had condom education. 38% um, of our students reported that they did get condom education. Um, that rate is lower than the middle sex rate of 47%. Different communities have um, longer periods of time where they have sexuality education. We do have a strong sexuality education program, but young people are allowed to be opted out. It is part of the state law that parents have the opportunity to opt their child out. So there may be young people that didn't get exposed to that education because they were opted out. Um, we also ask young people if they've been tested for HIVs, uh, HIV or um, 
sexually transmitted infections, 9% reported getting tested, and 6% reported getting tested for HIV. We also ask about impairment in sexual behavior. Um, among students that were sexually active, how many had used alcohol or drugs before the last time they had sexual intercourse? That rate was 21%. The local rate did decline by 3%, but we do have major concerns about this risk behavior because of the blurring of consent lines, um, the lack of protection used typically when young people are impaired. So again, it's, when we talk about substance abuse, we're also talking about the related risk behaviors that can go with those decisions to, to become impaired and then take other risks. Um, this is a new question for 2019, asking young people about sexting. Have they ever sent or received sexual messages or nude or semi-nude pictures electronically? That rate was at 33%, which is slightly lower than the league rate, but concerning. And I think for most adults, that's a hard number to see. And a reminder about monitoring of phones. And I'm going to put Officer Lewis on the spot just to ask. I know that there's been um, some changes in the, the district attorney's program that's available. Do you want to mention just a little bit about if you do have a case, what the procedure is? Uh, generally, we just interview uh, all parties involved. We end up taking their phones, uh, by, usually by consent of the parent. Uh, we wipe their phones completely. Uh, we do contact the DA's office, they have a child protection unit, which we contact them and uh, work with them on the case. So if, if young people are concerned, they can report it to the SROs, um, but it is something to just kind of be aware of. Um, we also asked if young people talked with their parents about sex um, uh, or an adult in their family at least once. 44% uh, said that they had that conversation. The league rate was 40%. I'd love to see that number much higher um, because the more trusted adults they can have a conversation with around safety and choosing to wait and protection, um, the more empowered our young people will be around their decision making. Um, we also asked young people about use of screen. Um, so 48% of Reading High School students said that they played video games or used a computer for three or more hours per day for something that was not schoolwork. Um, and that rate was 48%, which is comparable to the state rate, slightly higher than the league rate. Um, this is an important one. People aren't eating breakfast, <laughs> uh, which is a challenge because, you know, coming to school and then waiting a long time to have lunch. So encouraging breakfast, only 62% 60, uh, did not eat breakfast on all seven days. So we'd love to see that, that um, go down so we have more young people who are coming in ready to learn. Um, this is a set of questions on disordered eating. Um, so we ask questions around if they are taking a pill, powder, or liquid without a doctor's order to lose weight. Um, did they have a bulimic type behavior, making themselves vomit or take laxatives? And fasting behavior, did they not eat for 24 hours or more? And um, diet pills was at 3%, which is comparable to the leak rate, 5% for the vomiting behavior or laxatives, and 8% for fasting. The fasting has been consistently a big challenge. Um, so constantly encouraging young people to remember to eat, to not use that as a, a weight control method, um, because obviously the risk for them passing out, getting ill, is, is significantly high. Um, so again, reminder to eat breakfast, reminder to continue to eat. Uh, physical activity, we have a high rate of young people doing physical activity in Reading, which is wonderful. 92% reported um, being active at least 60 minutes per day in an activity that increased their heart rate and, and breathing hard. And that rate is higher than, than the comparisons. It also means that our concussion rate is slightly higher because the more people we have being physically active, the higher the risk for concussion. Um, so 17% of young people said that they had a concussion um, in the past 12 months. Um, in 2017, it, the rate was 11% for one concussion. Now it's at 10%. And if you look, scroll down a little bit to four or more concussions, that rate is 2%, which is low. But obviously, any type of significant multiple concussions is concerning. <coughs> I know the district has been working on concussion protocol and education and understanding around this issue. It's an issue that we're grappling with all across the country, but just something to be aware of and understanding. Trusted adults, again, going back to those protective factors, building as much trusted relationships as we can. 65% of high school students said that there was at least one teacher or other adult in their school that they could talk to if they had a problem. 14% said they're not sure, and 21% said no. Trusted adults outside of school, is there an adult or adults you can talk to about things that are important to you? 87% had someone in their life that they could do that with, and only 5% were not sure. 
And when we think about these two areas, um, this is an area that we'll explore more with young people um, in more conversation type settings. Um, you know, talking to young people about, particularly with this question, they might come to a teacher about something that's more school related. They might go to a home adult about something that's maybe a little bit more personal or vice versa. So there's different reasons why young people might feel a higher level of trust in the family versus in the school um, because of wanting to maybe keep some things private. Um, let's see, lack of sleep. Um, as you know, sleep has been a big topic and, and we are one of the districts that has gone to the later start, which is great for sleep. 79% um, of our young people at the high school level did not get eight hours or more of sleep. Um, and that is slightly higher than the league rate. Insufficient sleep is associated with so many different risk behaviors. Um, it increases the potential for substance use, um, unprotected sexual activity, uh, suicidal ideation, physical inactivity, obesity, and engaging in injury-related behaviors. So it's definitely an area that we want to keep encouraging healthy sleep and breakfast. The next set of questions focus on perception. So these are questions that are actually required by the federal government as part of the ARCASA grant that we have, which looks at how does an individual perceive how their parent might feel about certain things and how their peers might feel. And the research around these is that the higher the perceived risk of harm for a behavior, the less likely a person will engage in that behavior. But these behavior predictors are multifaceted and perception is just one area that can reduce risk. So if we look at perception of parental disapproval for smoking tobacco, the rate's at 96%, which is quite high. Um, and that rate is, is higher than when we look at smoking marijuana daily. There's less perceived risk of harm with um, people smoking marijuana according to young people's perceptions. We look at peer disapproval. You can see the rate for smoking marijuana daily is much lower um, than it was for perception of, of parental disapproval. Um, perception of risk of harm. Um, again, the rates for smoking are quite high, alcohol quite high, marijuana is much lower, using prescription drugs not prescribed to you is quite high. So we do have a lot of work to, to do in terms of perception of risk for marijuana. People often think because it is described as a natural substance that there's less risk. Um, there are many young people in the state of Massachusetts who are currently being treated for marijuana dependence. Young people do struggle with this issue. Um, so it is an area that we need to do more work for young people to understand a little bit more about. Um, and in terms of our health education, we also ask young people, did they get health education in these key areas? 73% said that they've been taught about HIV AIDS prevention, 84% about healthy eating and nutrition, 90% about alcohol and drug prevention, and 86% about bullying prevention. In terms of school support, there's a lot of different areas where the schools in our district has been working to support protective behaviors and reduce risk behaviors. Um, the importance of our staff, they're really the core of protective um, behavior work and connectedness. Um, social emotional learning um, integration into much of what we do. School-based individual and team support at the different levels. We have health education programs in the middle school in grades 9 and 11 at the high school. Um, substance abuse conversations, which is the expert screening process that's required by the state. We've been doing that now for four years. And that is um, something that allows the school nurse to have a conversation and assess risk and refer young people to services if needed. We have our chemical health and diversion programs, which are collaborations with the police department. Um, we offer youth mental health first aid training, which is designed to highlight and understand young people who might be struggling with those issues. Our interface referral service, which is a way for families and young people to access services. And then our Elliott Mobile Crisis Services, which is well used by our district to access and uh, get young people assessed for more crisis oriented issues. In terms of next steps, and Chris and John, feel free to jump in in terms of next steps, but our goal will be to get our district data committee together. Um, what we like to do is really dig into the data, look at not just what you're seeing, but cross tabs around gender, race, ethnicity, um, looking at specific um, data, how many young people who reported mental health issues, what are their grades look like, so we kind of look at the data in a little bit more of a deep dive. We will be doing presentations for parents in the community, and we will have an opportunity for students to be part of this process. So we often have conversations with young people, um, more open conversations about what it makes them think about, how do they feel about some of this stuff, um, and also to provide insight into how we can shape prevention. I do want to give a shout out for a couple events that our CAS is hosting. We have our annual meeting and film screening at the IMAX on September 25th. 
from seven to nine. That does conflict with a great high school event, which is back to school night, and I apologize for that. We had a, a window to have the IMAX, and so we took it. Um, but we will be working with the high school to host another screening in the spring for high school parents. Um, another event that we're doing is our annual recovery celebration at Lake Quantipowit. This is a partnership with our surrounding communities, and it's an opportunity to remember those that we've lost and also to highlight and celebrate those in recovery. So that is my first part of the YRBS findings. I'm happy to answer any other questions. Yeah, yes, thank you, Erica. Yes, Autumn. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. There are questions on the survey. We didn't get into some of that tonight because it requires a more careful look because the number of young people who respond to those questions are much smaller. So it's statistically different in terms of looking at that data. So we like to do that in the district committee before bringing it back out, but it is something that and it's also an area that will be very much part of the youth conversations, um, absolutely. And there's more questions um, on this current survey than there were previously related to those issues. So, good thought. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And so I guess I'll see you on the 26th for middle school yes. results. Um, <laughs> thank yeah, you. I didn't mention that at the Oh, I was going to wait until the calendar discussed, but we are meeting on September 26th. That's Thank you not, so much for the opportunity. That's been added to the calendar. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now we'll go into uh, reports. We don't have a student tonight. So. Oh. John, did you? Uh, we did have a rec committee meeting on Tuesday, which I did attend. Uh, seems to be the biggest thing is overall field space for youth uh, sports. With the shift in times of start, everything shifted back. So there's been some issues with that. Um, that'll be an ongoing, ongoing conversation. I do. Um, so I'm now the liaison for RCTV, um, and their next meeting is on September 17th. That's Tuesday. I can't go to that because I'm at the ad hoc meeting, so I went to the select board meeting where they did a presentation and talked to them and watched their presentation. Um, and they said they're always looking for new programming ideas, volunteers, and board members, so please consider um, contacting them or attending the meeting to learn more. Um, you can also learn more about RCTV and their history on um, our, they just celebrated their 20th anniversary, which is amazing. So there's a video, 20, RCTV in 20 minutes on their um, website. So if you want to know more about what they do. Board members Kathy Crook and Christopher Cridler presented at the select board meeting with Rob, who's here, thank you very much. Um, recorded the meeting and um, Luke was at the studio. They're both here, so I just wanted to give them a shout out, which makes the connections to our schools because they're always here, always trying to help us get the word out. Um, they were, uh, RCTV was thrilled to report that they've successfully signed their contracts with their service providers and that with town meeting supporting them, they're working on their new funding mechanism and getting their budget ready for next year. Um, RCTV is so supportive to the schools. They've been, at, they were at the Reading 375th, the RMHS Vigil at, Against Hate, school concerts programs, the Martin Luther King Day celebration, and so many more. And if one looks closely, often the videographers and editors are students of the high school. So they're not only getting professional experience, they're learning skills and they're learning to work with people and navigate crowds, um, as well as the technological skills, while they're also being empowered to provide an important service. So I think that it's really important to give 
the students and RCDV a shout out um, for what they do with the schools and for the schools. Um, I remember their help with the Pillars of Character program, getting it out there so families could learn with their kids when we couldn't have everybody sitting on the floor with the kids. Um, so in addition to engaging students in real and important communications work, RCTV is in their third year at the high school offering classes. And I think it's around, I think I heard it's about five classes right now, which students are fitting in even though the course loads are packed and the requirements are, um, have been changed. So um, it's really important. So you can learn more about RCTV on Facebook, Instagram, and their website. Um, I have other reports, is that? So I don't have to say much um, about RACASA because Erica just did uh, an awesome job. Um, but she did, I want people to know that she did leave handouts here on the table over there. One is for the interface program, which is a real wonderful resource to our families. Um, it matches people up with services, mental health services, and cuts a lot of the work out. So um, they figure out for you what your insurance will cover um, and your specific specific needs and there's um, it's offered by William James College and the handouts out there and there's also a substance use disorders resource list and RACASA goes to so many ev events to make these resources available um, and just another note about the September 25th documentary it's refocusing the conversation on what we can do to prevent substance use and substance abuse, not just how we respond to it. And the discussion, I think, will be really interesting. And I hope students go too, hint, hint, Autumn. Um, <laughs> um, and that, um, oh, she recommended that ages, people ask about what age students they should bring with them. And so she recommended, Erica at the select board meeting recommended like age 12 and up, but there's a trailer of the movie on their website, RCT, uh, Rakasa's website, and parents should look at that trailer and make their own personal decision as to whether the, the um, meeting will be appropriate, the documentary will be appropriate to them. And many thanks go to Jordan's and the IMAX for making it available, um, and it's awesome. They, um, Ms. Boynton and Ms. McNamara working together to figure out other times that the high school can, families can get to see it. We're really hoping that the um, middle schools and elementary school families will be drawn to this because as we heard, vaping's a real issue, energy drinks a real issue, a lot of um, the substance use, the discussion's really important. Um, she mentioned the Recovery and Remembrance walk on Quanapowit, and Rakasa is finalizing their search for the new outreach coordinator, so we should stay tuned. It's supposed to, we're supposed to hear pretty soon, which will be really nice. I don't know how Mrs. McNamara is doing all this without any help, so it's awesome the town is supporting an outreach director full time. Um, more. <laughs> so um, the next ad hoc meeting is this coming Tuesday, um, September 17th at 7 in Town Hall. If you want to get, if anybody has ideas about what the, um, the human rights organization should look like or should incorporate, they can either go to that meeting, they can contact me, and I will bring it to the table, please. Um, there's a Reading Embraces Diversity event coming up on October 2nd. They asked me to announce this. It's at 7 at the library. It's on their Facebook page. The State of Hate in Massachusetts. It'll be presented by the ADL. Robert Treston, who's their regional director, will be here. Check out their Facebook page because it's frightening how many hate incidents there have been, and we know about that in Reading. Um, and those are only the ones that have been reported. And that's really important to, to highlight because um, 
a lot haven't been reported. And the Pulse of Reading, the library, there are three conversations, community conversations coming up. Um, you can go on to their website, which is pulseofreading.org to find out more. Everybody's welcome, great conversations. I know a lot of us have taken part in them. Um, so it's trying to strengthen our community through conversation. And the three coming up are a matter of civility, defining our community, building community, sparking ideas and action, and belonging, which is focusing on diversity and inclusion. And you can get the dates and times on the website and you can sign up through there. Thank you for your patience. There just was a lot. There's always a lot going on in Reading. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm delighted to share with the committee that the CPAC, the Special Education Parent Advisory Council, had our first meeting two days ago, Tuesday, um, September 10th. Dr. Styes, right? It yes. Is doctor. Um, Dr. Styes was there. There was a really nice um, attendance. We had 10 parents, which for CPAC is actually a pretty healthy attendance. So there was um, a lot of energy in the room. Um, I'll quickly go through what I wrote down as highlights, but when we get to Dr. Styes, she can fill in any, any blanks. Um, Dr. Styes shared her entry plan, which was very well received by parents, and she encouraged um, the parents present to give feedback on that plan. She talked about work that's already happening in the district to um, streamline and make more consistent the beginning of school for students, um, for parents with students on IEPs, very well received by the parents, that work. Um, there is a new flyer that's very nice, um, sort of um, trying to publicize that the CPAC exists, that we want a really active, um, engaged community of parents um, who are advocating for students with special education needs. And um, this is now going to be going out yes. at every IEP meeting. Um, so when you meet about your child's special needs, you will, you will get this. Um, and we even had some brainstorming about all sorts of other places in the community we could drop these to really try to get the word out. So um, yeah, it's, it's really a very nice looking, very easy to read um, piece of material that is gonna help get the word out about CPAC. Um, focus areas for the upcoming year are of course IEP compliance, that's always high at the list. Also transitions to different schools is something that Dr. Stiles is interested in looking at as, as students transition out of one school, elementary or middle, into the next level, whether it's middle or high school, how does that transition look or rise to elementary as well? So really looking at those transition periods and also ongoing program review included in that is program descriptions, which was work that had started, um, but she's eager to continue. Um, the parents received all of this information, I think, very positively. There was a lot of brainstorming about um, partnering with other groups in Reading, like Reading Education Foundation, like Understanding Disabilities. So a lot of kind of active brainstorming about how CPAC can leverage other groups to become even more impactful. Um, the next meeting is Tuesday, October 15th, right here in the library at RMHS at 7 p.m. And there will be elections for board members at that meeting, I believe, yeah? Yes, I got that right. Um, so I just, I would really encourage if anyone has ever thought about maybe I should attend a CPAC meeting, I'd be interested in becoming more involved. This is a, this beginning of the school year, we have a new director of student services. This is a really nice time to get involved. So um, that's my report on CPAC. And then, oh, um, Fall Street Fair, I just wanted to mention that many of us were in jail <laughs> uh, for understanding disabilities, which does so much good in our schools, but it was nice to see particularly staff come out on a Saturday. Um, and support UD. Hmm? Sunday. Oh, Sunday. Well, it was a weekday, <laughs> weekend day, anyway. <laughs> um, and uh, many of us enjoyed working with our select board members at a joint table with the select board. I just, I don't have a, I just wanted to let everybody know that there's a, tomorrow night's football game, there's gonna be a nice presentation to honor uh, Nelson Burbank, so. Uh, I don't know a lot of details about, other than there's a, gonna be a proclamation. 645, yeah, just right. to start. 645. Black or just black? Yeah. I think it's black. Yeah. yeah. That's what I'd heard. Yeah. Kids do that. Mr. Weiss. 
Okay. Um, so Jamie hit on a couple of mine already, and Linda hit on a couple of mine already. <laughs> so I'll skip past the select board because Linda hit on the highlights for that. Um, finance committee is where I'll, I'll focus my big effort here. Um, I think actually, and speaking to the earlier presentation, uh, and Ms. Dowd may speak to this as well a little bit later, it sounds like some of the work that we're going to want to have done from the schools is going to be moved forward, um, specifically the Coolidge HVAC and the middle school server rooms. Uh, that has to go into the, the warrant for this coming November, but it would move forward one year, I think from 2021 to 2020. Um, so that would actually get done a little ahead of time and move that number up a little bit for Coolidge probably. Um, so that also, that's also related a little bit to some of the security needs in, in those server rooms as well, but they didn't go into too much detail. Uh, most of that's being funded by the fact that um, the debt for the turf did not have to be taken out publicly until later this year. So that debt is going to be taken out sometime in November, which meant that we didn't have to pay a prin principal charge and an interest charge this year, which freed up money to be spent on other things, um, which I thought was pretty interesting in the financing realm. Um, then the, the, term, the conversation turned greatly towards what to do with some of the things. Um, there, uh, Sean Brandt opened a conversation um, about, um, what do you call it, he called it sustainability fund brainstorming. Um, essentially, free cash sounds like it's going to get up to about 14% or $14 million uh, in the forecast, uh, give or take. And so there was conversation about, well, what does that mean? Um, and you know, he, he, he phrased it very well, so somebody go back and watch the FinCom if you're very interested. But it sounded like they were brainstorming things like, somewhat to what Chuck mentioned before, invest to save ideas. Um, and they looked at, at those of us that were representing the schools there to think about some of those too. So we might want to have a conversation. I'm sure you, you guys are already having conversations on those fronts and it might be something for us to discuss as well. Invest to save ideas so that we could spend some money now to save some money down the road. Um, which I think is encouraging, greatly encouraging. However, that was balanced by some of the unfunded ideas that the community has out there, in particular the stadium turf, which is currently budgeted or thought to be about 3.2 million, field house floors and bleachers, 1.7 million, birch metal field lighting, 1.9 million, 1 million for birch metal improvements, whatever the rec committee comes up with, 0.8 million for Parker turf replacement, which is probably four or five years out, and then Coolidge turf, if that ever comes, 1.4 million. So this is about 10 million of unfunded, you know, community priorities that might go up against that number as well. So it was an interesting back and forth discussion about whether that is available, is it not available, um, et cetera. Capital usually goes through debt, not so much through free cash, but it was an interesting conversation. Um, so anyway, that fiscal sustainability one I think was the most interesting for us. Um, in addition to that, probably the biggest news, uh, it sounds like Bob, uh, Mr. Lashner is forecasting about a 3.61% increase in net revenues next year, which will probably help us in some way, shape, or form, um, and somewhat, somewhat come down to us. But obviously, FinCom has to vote for that first, and it has to go through town meeting and all that kind of fun stuff. But anyway, that was the big thing there. Um, in terms of the town fair, one other thing I'd say is that we did have quite a few you know, residents come up and talk about different things. I had um, at least two or three residents come up and talk about the, the bid for extended day um, and pointed them to the website and pointed them to a couple of you as well that might be able to help them and it sounds like I saw that there were some postings already on that so I'm sure we'll hear from you guys about that maybe, hopefully. Uh, no, not tonight. Um, so that was, that was one thing so it was good to be able to provide some information about where to go to fill out the bid and submit the bid and all that kind of fun stuff. And we did have a couple of residents also although not many, just a couple, raised concerns about late start and whether kids are actually getting sleep. And I think Mrs. Borowski had a great idea about having a survey later on in the year. Hey, did this actually achieve what we thought it would achieve? Um, so that was um, some interesting points about those things. So. Thank you. Dr. Sties. <laughs> I think um, the CPAC discussion really kind of summed up a lot of the work we've been doing and the energy and commitment from the community, so I don't really have a, a new report for tonight. Thank you. Gail, did you? I think Mr. Wise covered the <laughs> so um, in regards to the extended day, the bid just did close yesterday, so we need time to go through all of the responses and do our due diligence, which is why we we did get several responses. We just have not had ample time to review responses and all of the information that came in with it. So we will be getting back to folks shortly. 
point of question. So then yeah. the posting that's out there now that shows who bid and and there were like two there's two PDFs on the website now. Those don't mean anything necessarily. Like nobody won a bid because of those or anything else like nobody that. Nobody has so we have all of the responses and now we will go through and evaluate them and then start to award contracts on it. But the bid itself is now closed. Dr. Darty. Step one thing. So last spring when we were going through all of the late start discussions and the, the, the big issue with the buses, but it was also tied into the, the kindergarten piece as well. Um, we said that we would review the routes and the times, the start times of all the routes after the first few weeks. So we did make a slight adjustment. Those have been sent out uh, to any, any of the riders. So essentially um, what's going to happen is beginning on uh, September 16th, the middle school route, which I believe started at 6.30, is now going to start at 6.55. Uh, the elementary route is going to begin now at 7.25, and the high school route is going to begin at 7.50. So those changes have been made effective the 16th. Will you say that again? Sorry, the times, I couldn't catch them that fast. So the middle school is going to begin at 6.55. The elementary will begin at 7.25, and the high school will begin at 7.50. Thank you. So the... Sorry, I didn't mean it. Were you done? Yeah. So the 630 went to 655. That's a big difference, right? Well, those were the original ones that the bus company suggested based on the length of the routes and the number of stops on those routes. So we, and we knew, we knew there would be some adjustments. We didn't know how, with the difference, but we knew. So all of the uh, information has been sent out to those parents. Do you recall what the elementary star one was before, off the top of your head? Before the 710? Before the change. The elementary was at 710? Pick up. When? Last year. La last this week, year, I guess. No, no, no. Oh, what, no, what it's doing now, what it is now. Oh, it's starting at 7 now. 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock, okay. So they both went back 25 minutes. Yep. Yeah, they all did. This is Kelly. Oh. Yes. Sorry. Do we have any information on the Metco buses transportation of those we made routes? No adjust adjustments as of yet. The traffic still is a little precarious with college move-ins. We're still looking at it. Thank you. Ms. Kelly. No reports. Thank you. Motion. Motion. Move to enter into executive session to discuss the reputation, character, physical condition, or mental health of an individual and the approval of minutes and not to return to open session. Second. Second. So roll call vote. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yep. <laughs> uh, we, uh, the calendar has been in the back of the pack. It's been updated. We, we added, uh, September 26th. It's it's actually not. In no, it's not. No, it's not. In, not yeah, in. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Co Dr. Corm. We added September 26th to the calendar. Uh, it's not in the calendar in the packet, but that will be uh, the superintendent's evaluation and the continuation of the uh, YRBS. Uh, survey at this point and like, we may add other things but that's the, the two main topics in that right now yes I have another question related to the calendar but not our calendar I'm wondering if a reminder has gone out to the teachers and the, the families forgive me if I missed it um, about the accommodation policy and the holidays coming up it's going out this weekend it's already it's been sent to the principals and it's going out this weekend thank you We do have a motion on the table, yes. so I think we can do a roll call. Yes. 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 Thank you.